good morning everyone. I'm Vivian. I am a visual artist and data scientist. Uh, right now I work with Doctors Without Borders, so I create a lot of content on visualizations, maps, um, animations, basically raising awareness about the work that we do. What that translates to is that I'm often creating content on topics that my colleagues and I are so passionate about, but the rest of the world either doesn't know about this issue or they don't know enough to care and understand why we care. And that's where stories are very powerful for the kind of work we do because we can build a narrative that is memorable and impactful so that our viewers can either walk away with a new piece of information or they are so moved by what we have to say that they take some kind of action. They can probably me. share our story. Um, they can share our story, decide to donate to us, or even sign a petition to take action. So stories are powerful, and we know this. That's not news to anyone here, um, especially not for people in marketing and the entertainment industry. They've capitalized on this tool forever. And instead of reinventing the wheel today, I'm going to present a story design framework that is used by the film industry. And it's really compatible for building data visualizations. We're going to start um, by going through some problems and misconceptions with data viz. Then I'm going to present the solution, which is the story design framework. And we're going to end with an example of how this is applied. So the first problem I encounter all the time is that the data will speak for itself. And this may be true if you have a super expert and niche audience member, um, niche audience who knows so much about your topic that they can see your graphic for a couple of minutes and immediately walk away with the insights. That's normally not the case in real life, right? We have a mixture of novice to expert audience members, so we have to be aware of what that ratio is and build our story message to address everyone. I like to think about my audience members in five categories. This is presented by the Harvard Business Review. Um, you start with your novice who know nothing about your topic, but they can learn more. Um, it's important to note that we shouldn't oversimplify our message because of this. No one likes to be talked down to, and that's only how you lose engagement really quickly. You have your journalists who know a little bit about your information, but are looking to learn more. Your manager has access to details on your topic, and they want to explore the themes with you. Expert is pretty self-explanatory, and then the executive, they may or may not have the same level of knowledge as uh, your expert or manager, but their biggest limitation is their time, right? So they only have a couple minutes with you, and they want to be able to walk away with the insights very quickly. Um, we want to keep this in mind when we're building our story message because it's always going to be a, some kind of ratio and mixture of these types of audience members. And um, that's going to inform how we craft our story. The next issue I encounter all the time is that more is better. Um, and especially in public health, this happens all the time because we want to be really politically correct and we want to present all sides of the view and empower you with all the information you need to make an informed choice. Um, I believe in that principle to the core, but what that often translates into is just way too much stuff on your visualization, right? Um, there's so much layers of information on here that your story message gets watered down. And their message is Gavi, which is a vaccine alliance, tackles cervical cancer. That's a strong message, right? Um, but looking at it, you don't immediately get that, that kind of feeling of tackle. First of all, the color balance, you know, tackle, you always think it's group A versus B, good versus evil, and then this green and purple isn't a natural contrast pair of colors. If you had like black and white, you know, then you know it's you know, good versus evil, or if you had red versus more of a neutral color, you know what you're looking for. And also these purple dots, um, they're supposed to represent the countries that are, uh, have access to the funding, but then the size of the bubble is the number of deaths for cervical cancer. So they're just packing layers and layers into this one graphic, and you walk away not knowing what the story message is. Um, 
This is going to sound counterintuitive, but as a designer, I'm always looking to cut things down uh, because we're limited by the space that we have, the resolution, the file size, and most importantly, our audience's attention span. I still have you guys. Okay. <laughs> 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 All right. So yeah, we want to be really um, thoughtful about what we put on in visualization and really maximize what we do. And story design is going to help us with this process. All right, so what goes into a good story? These are the big threes. This is a framework presented by SEAM, which is the Shared Experience Art Machine. It's an online community of writers and artists that is founded by the producer of the 007 films and the James Bond games. So all good stories have a premise, a dramatic question, and a story message. The premise is a universal truth. It's a proverb, it's a statement that people generally agree with. So an example that's, that everyone knows is um, you can't teach an old dog new tricks, right? In general, people agree with it, but you'll definitely find people who have a different viewpoint or um, have a different point of view on it. Uh, so the example that we're going to work with is absolute power corrupts absolutely. Okay. Your dramatic question is going to frame your debate for your viewer. This question is a very simple what if statement. The purpose of this is that you want to contextualize this topic so that it makes it personal for your viewers and your viewers are sitting there wondering yeah, what would I do in that situation, right? A good story puts this, makes this personal and we can always learn from it. Story message, this is your overall conclusion. Do you agree with the premise? Do you disagree? Or do you have a different angle that you want to present on it? Um, this is where you, you share your wisdom with your viewers. And most importantly, it's gonna answer the questions, why is this important? And why is this important right now? So why should I, as an audience member or a viewer, care about this topic? So going off our example, if our premise is absolute power corrupts absolutely, <coughs> dramatic question is, what if you were stronger and more powerful than everyone else in this world? I'm sure we all have very different answers to that question. Your message is, with great power comes great responsibility. That is powerful, right? I can say one line and almost everyone in this room knows I'm talking about Spider-Man. And that's the effect that we want to create. We want to be able to have one line that's so clear that even months and years down the line we <laughs> still remember what I'm trying to say and what we're trying to convey. And now let's look at how this fits into the data creation process. Here's the very general stages of visualizations. You start with your conception, come up with your idea, collect your data, do the analyses, and then you visualize. So when you're writing a story or a novel, you're supposed to start by working on your story message first, and then let that inform what dramatic question and premise you create. For us, we don't want to do that, because if we start with the story message at the conception phase, that's going to bias what information we collect and what data points we get. Um, we really want to let the data inform our story message and not the other way around. So for us, we're going to start with the premise. That's how you choose your topic. What truth do you want to explore and gather the information for? Um, so you, you have your data and then you start analyzing, you test your hypotheses, run your models or your summary statistics, and you want to do this enough time so that you build the data that answers um, the question, why is this important right now? Once you have enough insights and relationships that answer that, that is your story message, right? You have a very clear story message, and from there, you move on to visualize. Um, the last stage for us will be to do the dramatic question. This is, again, framing this in a context that makes sense for your audience member and you want to kind of bury your story message in. Because if, if my message was um, with great, great 
power comes from responsibility, and I tell you that at the start of my story, it kind of comes off preachy, and it might turn some of your audience members away. So your dramatic question is going to frame the debate so that it kind of uh, your viewers can explore the information and then come realize the story message on their own. Um, and once you have your dramatic question, then you choose what medium is best used to frame this debate, right? This is normally not how the process works. A lot of times I get approached by people to work on a project and normally what happens is that they see a really cool interactive map or interactive graph and they ask if I can do it fitting our data into that model. That's not the best way to, to create visualizations because they're coercing your data into the technology as opposed to letting your data inform and choose what medium to use. I'm flying by this, <laughs> by the way. Okay, I'm saving you time, I'm catching up. So now we're gonna go through an example of how this is applied. This is uh, Napoleon's March by Charles Menard. It's probably the most famous visualization. I'm sure you guys are all aware of this and I've seen this as an example for like the golden rule of the gold, uh, standard of data visualization. I was recently at a talk with Edward Tufte, and he loves this graphic. But he also said that this is an anomaly, right? That the information here, this structure and this layout is only good for this information. And that means it's not reproducible. And I, while I agree with what he was saying, it makes it really hard when you try to use this as an example and you can't actually take elements from it that help you do your own work. So I'm going to explain why this is a great visualization in story design terms, and then hopefully that, that frame of thinking will, will be useful for the work that you do. Let's start with the premise. So a good premise for this is um, ruthless ambition leads to destruction. Okay. The data that was collected are the troops marching from the start to Moscow, that's the tan line. The troops retreating, coming back, that's the, the black line underneath. Um, there are geographical points, there are dates, and then the weather underneath, right? So it's getting colder and colder as we're retreating. I am from California, and the moment it gets under 30 degrees, you will not see me outside. So I don't have the same ruthless ambition as Napoleon does. Um, but the, the story message in this is pretty clear, right? It's an anti-war message. You see the, the contrast between the troops at the starting point and the troops at the ending point. But if I plastered war is bad on top of this, that would turn a lot of people away because it comes off preachy and some people believe war is necessary. I don't know, that's a whole other discussion on its own. Um, so the story message is pretty clear. Now we're going to go over the dramatic question. And I'm going to show how his layout really was intentional and works great for this kind of story message. The dramatic question that fits this is, what if you had control of the largest army in the world? Right? We would all have very different responses to this question depending on our values and what we care about things like that. And so you're already kind of questioning what we're doing. Um, and, oh, sorry, got excited. Uh, okay, sorry. Okay, question. what would you do if you had the large army, right? Um, so we read left to right, top to bottom, and after we read the intro paragraph, our eyes naturally go to this section of the graph right here, right? We're gonna read left to right. In this frame right here, you already know and you see the story message. You see the big contrast of the thick tan line versus this little tiny line of the troops retreating. 
So your, your whole story message is framed right here in your first interaction with it is you see the consequence of having ruthless ambition, right? And that's the minimizing troops at the end. So you, you're already wondering, what would I do in this situation? And I think that's what makes this a very powerful visualization. And how he maps the distance traveled, he wraps it around so that this first frame, you get it. Okay. So here's, again, the summary of um, Menard's visualization. Ruthless ambition leads to destruction. Story message, make love, not war. Uh, <laughs> if you are interested in learning more about story design framework, I suggest go to sing.tv. It's a really great community online. They also have a book on Amazon. It's about $5. It's a really great investment. So if you're new to storytelling, this process is going to be kind of challenging. And my best advice for, for diving into this is to just go through some visualizations and kind of work through the same exercise we did. Try to pull out the big threes in these visualizations and see if you can craft that story because this frame of thinking will really help you inform the next time you do your data visualization. Thank you. She made the mistake of leaving almost four minutes left for questions. <laughs> <laughs> a dramatic question. Go for it. Yes. What did you do with slides? Uh, this is reveal.js. I um I drew my slides on Illustrator. Yes. Howdy, thanks. It's really great as, as a writer, I say this. Okay. Has anyone looked at before and afters? So for example, mm -hmm. Doctors Without Borders, can they mm -hmm. gauge mobilization and impact from before this recent era of data visualization? <coughs> Is it actually getting people to donate and participate more? That's a great question. Um, so for, for, I'm only gonna speak on behalf of Doctors Without Borders um, because I just know the organization. So how, how we are designed, our, our communications department is separate from the fundraising department. Um, and then, so most of the time our communication is all about raising your awareness. That is our end goal, right? So that's the kind of visualizations and projects that we build. We wanna build a story that raises awareness because when you're trying to get donors to contribute to your organization, it's a challenge, A, if they don't know the topic, and then B, they don't care, right? So I'm working on a project right now to get Pfizer to lower the vaccine costs, and it's so hard to get someone from the U.S. to care about a kid in Ethiopia not getting vaccinated. So we have to kind of do that awareness layer first, and then that's where our story message is really powerful. Thank you for your presentation. Um, how do you formulate your story message and prevent your premise from too much coloring what the real story message is, given the data? Uh, sorry, can you repeat that? <laughs> how do you craft your story message? Uh, obviously, as, as, as data scientists, you know, um, one tries to uh, be data driven. Uh -huh. uh, but you can't be data driven uh, at, without some sort of question or hypothesis. Right. So, what techniques uh, do you find yourself using to prevent the hypothesis from too much coloring the um, the end story message? The story message. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's a good question, and I think they kind of go hand in hand. Right? Depending on how your hypothesis tests out, if the data supports your hypothesis or it doesn't at the end, you know, both scenarios will build your sort of message. So for example, if I'm doing stuff like, um, you would you think vaccines are priced based on a country income level. So poorer countries pay less for vaccines, right? 
Um, that's my hypothesis. But the data that we're seeing right now is that it's, that's actually not true. You know, so the story message could be that like we maybe just don't know enough about the pricing levels and we need more information and that can in its way be its own story as well. And so I think when you're testing your hypotheses, whichever way they turn out, let that really drive your story as opposed to trying to force your hypothesis on top. Zero minutes, second. Oh, yeah. Uh, I have a question. So when you were showing, which I thought was really uh, quite uh, succinct, you have these different, uh, let's call it constituencies you're trying to address, your novices, managers, whatever. What is your suggestion in terms of if you're giving a presentation uh, in order, f kind of the ordering in which you go? Typically, in my experience, the executive who has the money, you're going to make sure they're addressed first and not going to drop off. But do you have any kind of practical advice when you are got it all together, how you um, layer it so presumably the experts and maybe novices are going to persist longer into the presentation if needed, so that yeah. if they do drop off, you've left them uh, best addressed best given, address. given your uh, ability? Yeah, um, I, I think a good summary page, first of all, would be really helpful. So for me, it was just the outline of my talk, right? I gave you a quick overview. This is what I'm talking about. And so if you are presenting a project and something like that, you can do the same thing. These are the big overall themes that we're exploring. And um, something that Edward Tufte actually talked about was maybe coming in with like a printed summary that has your talking points letting them read for the first five minutes. And that will, you know, so even if they drop off, at least they have the sheet of paper that has all the information they need to get out of it. Thank you again. <laughs>